Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com. And IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEWLocal102.org. This week on NJ Business Beat, relief for restaurants and more. The business community reacts as Governor Murphy eases COVID-related restrictions. Plus, startling unemployment numbers as we learn women may be bearing the brunt of the pandemic's impact on the economy. And no longer your typical nine to five. In our deep dive, we dig into the new normal inside the office and find out why many companies are turning to permanent remote work even after the pandemic subsides. That's ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. We begin this week with another baby step toward a full reopening of New Jersey's businesses. Governor Murphy has raised the state's strict indoor capacity limits on businesses from 25% to 35%, citing a decline in hospitalizations of COVID-19 patients. And the governor lifted the statewide ban on serving meals past 10 p.m. Mary Lou Halverson, leader of the New Jersey Restaurant and Hospitality Association, says the changes might help some restaurant owners hang on just a little longer. I don't know if it, the, the actual number is gonna do that much of a difference, probably talking about a couple tables here and there, but what it will give them is the hope that um, you know things are improving. Of course, the hope is that if businesses have more customers coming in, perhaps they can staff up and welcome back workers who have lost their jobs in this pandemic. New Jersey-based ADP reported this week that nationwide hiring in January was stronger than expected, but other data show a disturbing trend. Millions of people are just dropping out of the workforce entirely. Many of them are women who had to focus on childcare and virtual learning challenges. Andy Challenger, an executive at the outplacement firm Challenger Gray and Christmas says, since the pandemic began, more than 2.1 million women have called it quits. He says alarm bells should be going off because studies show diversity makes companies more resilient. The so staggering size of uh, the amount of people that have left the workforce is going to be a, a real challenge for individual companies and for the country as a whole to get back onto sound footing in terms of diversity. Uh, we're only three years out from the start of the Me Too movement, uh, where we saw in such vivid detail the consequences of not having women represented at the top of power structures within organizations. Elsewhere, there's an organization in New Jersey working to convince companies to set up shop in the Garden State. Choose New Jersey is a privately funded economic development organization. Even in the midst of a pandemic last year, the group helped 33 companies relocate or expand their operations in New Jersey. Jose Lozano, President and Chief Executive Officer, is optimistic about this year. In 2021, we know that there are countless companies that are going to be announcing that are looking to explore relocating or expanding in New Jersey. We have a couple of them in store that I do believe will be announced in the, in the coming weeks with significant job investments. And some of the companies that we're talking to right now could be upwards of five, six, seven hundred new jobs that they'd be bringing into the market. More than three quarters of New Jersey business leaders think the economy will improve over the next 12 months according to a survey by Island-based Provident Bank. But the bank's president and CEO, Tony Labazetta, says there's less confidence about job creation. I think it's about getting people rehired back into positions that existed. Um, we also don't know what the paradigm looks like relative to if people learn to operate more efficiently um, during this process and will some of those jobs come back. Uh, my sense is the majority of them will. 
Well, it's difficult to call if all of them were. One Atlantic City employer this week decided to give an extra thank you to its workers. The Hard Rock Hotel and Casino is handing out a million dollars worth of bonuses to 2,000 frontline employees. Executives say it's a way to show appreciation to those workers who've had to deal with working throughout the pandemic. Those are the individuals that were out of work for three months and really needed uh, you know, the, the, the extra dollars to really help them out, putting food on the table, things like that. So it was really about supporting our line level employees who work so hard and have really, since reopening, really put us in a, in a different uh, role here in Atlantic City. We've really done well the last six months. An update to a story we reported on last week, and that's the growth of the gig economy. Many residents have turned to gig work with apps like Uber and DoorDash. There's now a new group operating in the state to support those workers. It's called the New Jersey Coalition for Independent Work. We spoke with Christina Renna, the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Southern New Jersey, about the group's mission. Christina, this coalition looking out for gig workers is a real interesting mix of groups. Can you kind of explain um, how this all came to be? Sure. So obviously we've been faced with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic nationally and worldwide. And one of the things we saw as a result of that was unfortunately, of course, uh, a huge dip in job opportunities, unemployment skyrocketing and the like. What ended up happening as a result of that is jobs in what is kind of known as the gig economy seemed very interesting and appealing to those that were unfortunately forced to be laid off as a result of the pandemic. So certain organizations like Uber and Lyft, DoorDash and Instacart became a very attractive option for people that were in unfortunate situations and looking for flexibility and a way to make money um, while everyone was forced to stay home delivery was the best way to get food. Um, and so there are four organizations that really banded together, um, helped the people as a result of the jobs that they were able to employ, and then helped businesses and small businesses as well. So among the people that have signed on, um, your chamber, other business groups, there are faith leaders, the app companies themselves are part of the coalition. Is everyone approaching this with something different in mind or what's the end game that everyone is sharing in terms of a goal? I think the shared goal at the end of the day is to make sure that these workers have the protections they need while still have the flexibility they need to be able to work and give back to the people and then the businesses, as well as, again, just seeking employment. What we saw in the pandemic was unfortunately in our urban communities, our black and brown communities, a disproportionate amount of layoffs and the like. And so many of the gig workers and independent contractors that work for companies um, were, you know, were gravitated to these types of jobs. I guess it's so interesting how this is going to play out in terms of once the pandemic winds down and hopefully ends soon, uh, how many people might decide to continue doing gig work or how many restaurants might learn that DoorDash really helped them out during this period. So um, this might not just be kind of a one-off, this might be an issue that changes the New Jersey labor market for the future. Absolutely, it'll be very interesting to see a lot of different trends after we emerge from the pandemic as it relates to workforce development and employment, but this is certainly one of them. I think it should be noted that 37% of the people that do, you know, fall into the category of, you know, the gig economy that are doing these kinds of services, they do it as supplemental in, in income. Now, that being said, as we just said, that number, of course, has grown due to layoffs that we've seen during the pandemic. But for so many people, it's supplemental. For so many people, it has become more full-time work. So it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening because, I'm only one person, but I tend to believe that sometimes the luxury of getting certain things delivered, we've all become quite accustomed to. So there's a good chance, I think, that a lot of these jobs are going to be very desirable and certainly in need post-pandemic. Christina, thank you so much. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you and thank you.
Christina was talking about changing trends in the workplace. Well, here's another one, remote work. That might stick around longer than we think. We're putting remote work in focus this week, especially after seeing a recent Deloitte survey. Thousands of top level executives who were polled said that close to one third of their staffs may be working from home permanently even after the pandemic ends. As for employees, they've adjusted to wearing sweatpants and attending Zoom meetings. More than 70% believe remote work is successful, according to a PwC survey. More than a third say working from home has made them more productive. The majority of those surveyed would like to continue to work remotely for at least three days each week, even after pandemic concerns end. The changing nature of how and where we work in New Jersey was the subject of a recent Rutgers University report co-authored by Professor Jim Hughes, Dean Emeritus of the Blaustein School. One of the uh, more interesting aspects of your report when you look out into the future is just uh, how work might permanently change. It just seems that we might not go back to the way things were. No, we're going to have a new normal. We don't know exactly what that new normal is, uh, but we're not going back to pre-pandemic New Jersey. Uh, really, we've discovered uh, or finally recognized that work is an activity. Work is not, not simply a place. Uh, but I think what we can say for certain is uh, we're not going to go back to bringing every employee back to the central office five days per week. Uh, we're going to new effective work patterns going forward. And in your mind, that changes the way we view commercial real estate, correct? It's going to have a big impact on the commercial real estate market. Positives and negatives for New Jersey, obviously. Uh, the amount of space in the central office uh, uh, may contract. However, uh, we're going to have work from home and we may have distributed satellite facilities that would be uh, established near where there's cluster of residences of the key workforce and the like. Uh, New Jersey uh, was sort of the, the leading it was at the leading edge in the 20th century and sort of sprawling two or three story office buildings and the like. They fell out of favor uh, really over the past two decades. However, uh, what I've termed it is a turn of the ground scrapers as distinct from skyscrapers. Uh, and a lot of those ground scrapers uh, can be very effectively used for satellite facilities, for outposts and the like. Uh, and we see a lot of inquiries being made about space availability from major corporations uh, as they change their entire real estate footprint. Uh, so that could be a positive for New Jersey's distressed office uh, parks and office markets. But what about our urban centers where we do have large buildings? Would that accelerate um, a, a flight from the urban areas? I don't think it'll, it'll, it will cause a flight from urban areas. Uh, those facilities are going to have to be reconfigured. They're going to have to be made coronavirus proof and the like. Uh, density in those buildings may be less. Uh, and not all companies are going to want to have a distributed workforce. Some companies, some organizations really need that face-to-face -face interaction uh, for creativity reasons, for generating new ideas and the like. Uh, but it's not going to be business as usual. There's going to have to be substantial adjustments made, substantial transformations made, uh, because it is going to be a new economic world. And that world, it does seem, will include permanent work from home for some then. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, studies have shown uh, that it's been very effective despite distractions. It has not been perfect home environments uh, the past 11 months. Uh, uh, many households have had to deal with children at home and their education at home uh, and the like. But if we get back on track, uh, and we have our children going back to school and having face-to-face -face instruction, those home environments may be even more conducive uh, to uh, intense private work. So we're gonna see people uh, working more at home. Uh, that's gonna save on commutation costs uh, and the like. 
Uh, and some of those major office buildings uh, are going to be transformed into what has been termed the hub as a club. Uh, and so those major facilities will be uh, used for onboarding new employees, uh, for large employee gatherings, uh, for uh, special events to build up uh, organizational cultures and the like. Uh, but most likely they're not gonna be used for bringing every employee back to the office five days per week. And we're gonna have permanent adjustments into how work is actually conducted and where it's conducted. Professor Jim Hughes, good to talk to you again. Thank you good so to much. Talk to you. Making the decision to return to the office is a tough one. Tom McCormick, a partner at Monmouth County-based Resources Real Estate, shared with us his thought process on working from home and bringing people back to the office. And his operations manager, Lexi Barrett, told us what she had to do to make sure their offices were safe. Thomas, Lexi, it's great to talk to you both. And, and Thomas, I wanna start with you. Tell us what it's been like as somebody in charge of a business having to make the decision and think through the idea of bringing people back to work uh, after they've been away from the office due to the pandemic. Well, so thank you, Rhonda. We um, actually at Resources Real Estate closed our businesses before we were ordered to. We just sort of saw the writing on the wall and we were very proactive. Everybody was working from home and uh, we kind of didn't miss a beat. And so then when the governor uh, had identified real estate as an essential service fairly on in the pandemic, so we were technically able to go back to work uh, much sooner than most uh, businesses. However, we continued to work remotely out of a concern for safety. The agents were certainly doing sales um, out in the field, but our offices remained closed until uh, June. And we've, we did reopen with a lot of protocols in place. Um, so we have been open, but it's been sort of a partial opening. Lexi, tell me a little bit about some of the protocols you had to learn that really uh, made sure that people were going to be safe and able to return to work. So it was funny because Tom and I kind of, you know, sat down and figured out certain protocols before I even went for the certification. Um, and, and some of that is, you know, just kind of going with the guidelines that we had at that time. So social distancing. Um, just to give you an example, we set up certain workstations and you know, so that people wouldn't just automatically sit wherever they wanted. We physically removed the chairs at non-work stations. And that kind of helped to prevent people from sitting wherever they want. You know, it forced them to remember, okay, there's this workstation and then six feet away is another one. Uh, we also have sanitation stations throughout each office, which we felt was really important because not only do we want agents and staff to wipe down their workstation before they start, but also when they finish. You know, um, we just tried to think of whatever we possibly could that would keep our staff, agents, and clients, you know, as safe as possible. Lexi, what was the response, not just from the workforce, but also the clients who were coming into the office? I think people really and truly appreciated um, that we were so forward thinking and we kind of got ahead of everything and made sure, I mean, you know, safety to us is really one of the most important things. We would never want to put any of our staff, any of our agents or clients in harm's way. So I think that people really did appreciate the thought that we put into everything. Tom, there's been some studies about how many people actually will return to the office that some people are comfortable working from home, some businesses have found that it works for them. Do you anticipate that all of your employees will come back or have you learned something from this episode that might make you rethink who has to be in the office when? Well, I'm sure my staff will be eagerly awaiting my response <laughs> uh, to this question. One of the things that really, really pleased me was the productivity, I think the efficiencies that we saw uh, very early on were really great. Our, our staff, just they're really remarkable. I think they were working harder from home uh, despite you know some obstacles uh, when you're home and trying to get things done. So uh, we have been sort of relooking at how we go forward from here and whether or not it doesn't make sense. I mean, 
certainly from the standpoint of paying for a lot of uh, retail and office space, it, it kind of warrants from a business standpoint to sort of relook at that. But even from a, a staffing standpoint, I think a lot of them enjoy working from home. But the other part is that we have such a strong culture. We, you know, we've actually gotten awards for being a top workplace. And that I think more so than anything has been the stumbling block or the, or the challenge for people that they miss just being with each other and collaborating in a way that isn't quite the same on a Zoom meeting or by phone. So things have totally changed and we're just gonna be open to it and see what makes the most sense and what helps us to be as productive as possible. Tom and Lexi, thank you so much for sharing your story with me. Thank you, Rhonda. So what happens if an employee gets called back to work and then gets COVID-19? It is a big, risky issue for companies. Michelle Sakurka, the president and CEO of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, is fighting for business liability protections, and she told me where things stand. Michelle, one of the big issues when we think about employees going back to the office is the business liability issue for employers. This is something that you have been fighting about for some time. Where do we stand right now in New Jersey and across the US on this issue? Yeah, so business liability protection is a really big deal for business. We know businesses are out there, you know, checking the safety boxes on protocols and procedures to bring their workforce back safely, and they take this very seriously. And so we have asked for the proper balance that when a business can check all the safety boxes, they're given liability protection in exchange for that. So we're not saying, you know, protect those who are acting recklessly or not following the rules. We're saying, you know, provide balance for those who are. So where are we in New Jersey? Um, as we understand, you know, this bill is dead on arrival in that the legislature does not have an appetite to take this up at the state level. Um, across the country, you know, there's at least 12 states, uh, if not a few more, uh, who have passed uh, bills into law that do provide liability protection, given again that a business is responsible in dotting their I's and crossing their T's when it comes to safety. We also have engaged our federal delegation um, asking them uh, for a national relief on this and a national program that would stand up a pandemic relief fund, similar to the 9-11 fund that we saw uh, back after 9-11, so that those who are aggrieved by circumstances that are wholly outside of our control can have a place to go to get remedies. What are we seeing in terms of litigation where somebody goes to work, they get COVID and say, hey, you know what, it's your fault. Yeah, unfortunately, there was just a study last week um, where we heard that New Jersey is number one, uh, having the most um, cases against employers for um, contraction of COVID at the, at the work site. Do you think the lack of any protections will make businesses hesitant about calling their workers back? Well, I think businesses are taking a long, hard you know, pause and thought um, because they're, they're, they're concerned about this. I mean, look, right now we have a shift in the workers' comp presumption that if someone um, contracts COVID, there is a presumption that they contracted it in the workplace, regardless of the fact that they may have been somewhere uh, either socially or traveled somewhere, uh, you know, where, where COVID is, is perhaps, you know, rampant. Um, and so the burden is on the employer in the first instance to come back and prove that it wasn't um, contracted in the workplace. That means increased workers' comp costs, and that means increased costs for defending suits that otherwise uh, we shouldn't have. In terms of the inaction and the um, lack of um, desire to do anything in New Jersey, is there any way legislation can be amended so there's some sort of protections? You said it was dead on arrival. I'm just wondering if there's any wiggle room anywhere on either side. You know, we, we're hoping that if we um, had the opportunity to go back and visit, for example, you know, the workers' comp issue and continue to carve out exceptions, um, you know, there was an exception for nursing homes, you know, early on and, and health care. Um, and we're just going to continue to look at how do we chip away at the edges if we can't get a comprehensive resolution to this. Michelle, you and I have talked about this uh, before, but I'm wondering in light of this liability issue, will that make some companies decide perhaps to continue work from home on a more permanent basis, at least for some of their workers? 
You know, I have a feeling this is always going to be part of the discussion. Um, these are the factors that business has to take into consideration as they're planning for the future of their workforce and how that workforce is going to meet their needs. Do you think this business liability issue is kind of the number one sticking point right now for the business community? Well, there's so many, Rhonda. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you just think about um, the costs and expenses on on man of new mandates on business, when you think about right now, everyone you know clamoring to get a vaccine for their workforce, and we're still waiting to see how we're going to def define essential workers. But you know what? We can't put all the eggs in the vaccination basket. We know the vaccine is one mitigant in what must be a comprehensive program and addressing COVID in the future. Michelle Sukurka, good to see you again. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Rhonda. And thank you for watching NJ Business Beat. Are you a business interested in sponsoring NJ Business Beat? Contact Steve Priolo at the email or phone number you see at the bottom of your screen. I'm Rhonda Schapler. We'll see you next week. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW Local 102.org.